I feel like I've always had uh, that sort of duality. Just in my normal life, I feel like I've always had like, maybe not literally two different worlds that I've had to, to balance, but um, two different versions of me <laughs> that both want to, 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 to have control. And both of those sides are always uh, not in agreement with what to do uh, or what projects to make. And even as a kid, I just always was super into the idea of just two worlds, of coming to terms with, with being from two different places. Hello, salut, bonjour, welcome to The Lost Bay, a show about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. I'm Iko. Today my guest is Bats, designer of the RPG My Body is a Cage. As I release this episode, Bats is running a Kickstarter for the extended edition of the game. Actually, the Kickstarter is in its last week right now. In My Body is a Cage, there are two worlds. The one you live in during daytime, very much like the ones we live in ourselves, and the one you dream during nighttime. And when you dream, you go exploring dungeons. Basically, you dungeon crawl in your dreams. We'll be talking about this theme of duality with bats and much more. But first, here is how Bats had his first dungeon crawling RPG experience. I've been playing since I was, I think, 13 or 14. I never wanted to play because I always thought it was super nerdy. And my dad played it, you know, so I was like, oh, I don't want to be like my dad. We had like this little card shop in this small town I grew up in. Um, so they sold like magic cards. Um, and the guy at the card shop had the the player's handbook. And he was like, if you buy the book, I'll run a session for you guys. It's still like one of the most memorable sessions I've ever had playing you know, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I was, I mean, I was hooked from there. After that first foundational D&D game experience, Bat started DMing games immediately. And then after a while, around 2015, he started writing and slowly posting things on Reddit. So after playing and DMing D&D for so many years, how did you discover the OSR or post OSR scene? Or, or do you still play D and D now? Or you know, I, you hear a lot of stories about people kind of getting stuck with D and D for a long time. But my my friends were always really open about trying a bunch of other systems. So we were always looking online for like the next thing to do to make like a new fun campaign to play. But I didn't know about the OSR until after I started writing stuff and posting it on Reddit. It wasn't until I started creating my own stuff that people were like, oh, hey, this reminds me of this blog post and would link it to me. And I sort of got uh, a secondhand experience to the OSR. Like, I would never consider myself a part of it. I wasn't there for most of the stuff, but I was definitely like a watcher. Okay, so what was the creation process behind My Body's a Cage? Was it like an idea that took a long time to emerge or was it rather like a sudden spark or how did it start? It was It was definitely... Um, it was a long time coming. It started originally as a mecha game. I like mechs. I think they're cool. I like a lot of the themes that play into that. Um, and so I worked on that for like a whole summer, just kind of toying with it, and then ended up completely trashing it. I was like, I don't like this. I'm going to put this away for a while. And then when the lockdown started, I picked up Persona 5 and started playing that and kind of got really deep into Persona, the whole series. So the Persona series is a series of Japanese dungeon crawling slash visual novel video games that started back in 1996, which last installment, Persona 5, was released in 2020. It's a JRPG, so it's got like the dungeon crawling aspect, but it's set in like a modern setting and the dungeons are inside people's heads, their dreams. That sort of idea has always been one that I've liked, just having a world inside of a world, just dream interpretation. And so finding that game, like finding a game that had already done it well, was just like a big inspiration to be like, oh, this isn't such a strange idea. Like other people have this idea too. So maybe I can write it and not feel so <laughs> like weird about it. So in the game, there are two words, two parts. 
the delight part and the dream part. The two words are not totally disconnected. There are mechanics that link the daylight part to the main part, to the dream part. And also there's like a, a common mood that creates a, like a, a sense of unity. Does that make sense? And, and if yes, how did you find that balance, you know? Yeah, no, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, Because that's definitely something that I I had struggled with a lot is that I needed each of these different like phases or world to interact with one another. So like the things you do in one help you prepare for the other. And in that way, it's very similar to like downtime and like a normal dungeon crawling game. Uh, You know, you go into the dungeon, you get a bunch of treasure, and then you spend time selling it and buying items and uh, hanging out with different characters. So I just kind of made a stronger divide, like literally splitting them between two worlds, but then just tried to make the stuff that takes place in the daylight kind of preparation for, for the dungeon itself at night. There is a table that is a perfect example. It's a D10 table with sample dungeon rooms. Each room calls back elements from the character reality or the character backstory. For example, um, there's the room number two. The room is your childhood house, but larger. So I was wondering, are you going to do that sort of things in the next issue of the game? Oh, definitely. That's that's sort of like... And this kind of runs all the way back to me and my friends trying a bunch of different systems when we were, you know, in high school. We would play a lot of D20 modern, so just modern setting, modern characters, and we would just play ourselves. Or we would do like a zombie apocalypse or superheroes and stuff like that. But a lot of times we would like to play as ourselves. And I feel like using the the real world or just some stuff from your real life to influence things. It's just been something that I've always been fascinated with. Games like Munchkin, the card game, it has cards that like give you powers based on things that are happening at the table. And then games like Werewolf that are social games, but you get roles that let you do things as a person that affect the game. Things like that have always just been really interesting to me. So yeah, in this expanded edition, I'm doing a lot more of that sort of stuff. The dungeons will pull from your character's backstory and just from the things that have happened during the day. Okay, and what does playing a character close to yourself uh, brings to the game experience for you? I mean, I feel like it goes back to just um, to just like those times when you were a kid um, and you would just be playing pretend, you know, like out in the woods or out in your friend's backyard or something. And like, yeah, sometimes you would play, you know, a character you saw on TV, but most of the time you would play yourself in that world it's not something i've ever really interrogated to figure out why i like it but uh, <laughs> it's just it's just one of those things that i've always been fascinated by that sort of like being yourself or just being like a, a normal person sucked into a fantasy world or, or just a world that's different than your own that's always been something that um i've liked but yeah i'm not really sure why i like it <laughs> it's just it's just sort of there and it's always been there and uh it's just taken me a while to, to, to explore it like in, in a tabletop game, I think. I love the style of your game. I love the mechanics and the ideas behind them. Thank you. They bring a lot of flavor. They are not just cool. They are cool, but they're not just cool. But the thing I love the most is that idea of duality. I, I project myself so much into it. You know, I recognize myself in that. And I might be wrong, but I feel that a lot of people from the scene might somehow experience this uh, duality. The duality between daily life, like the 9 to 5 job, and the other life, like <laughs> late at night or early in the morning, dedicated to TTRPGs. So does that make sense? Yeah. I feel like I've always had uh, that sort of duality just in my normal life. I feel like I've always had like maybe not literally two different worlds that I've had to to balance, but um, two different versions of me <laughs> that both want to, to 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 have control. Like the the side of me that wants to be artistic and the side of me that wants you know to to just make money. And both of those sides are always uh, not in agreement with what to do uh, or what projects to make. But um, I feel like I, even as a kid, I just always was super into the idea of 
just two worlds of coming to terms with being from two different places. Like at least for myself, coming from a, a family that's like Catholic and has a lot of Catholic beliefs, but then I'm entirely not like that. But I still have that inside of me, and so there's like this this push and pull of like this traditionalism that my family you know upholds, and then the progressivism that I uphold. I feel like there's always just the two different sides almost in anything I do. Even before I could do this full time, I worked in an office and that was my life. And then when I came home, I wrote for tabletop stuff and that was my life. And it was balancing both of those things. So I'd like to think it's a pretty universal feeling, that feeling of kind of having to be two places at once or having to figure out, you know, which, which person to be. But, um, I'm I'm super interested um, when it comes to the game itself and hearing how other people experience that sort of duality. Like people talk to me about their experiences being queer in the game sphere and how that feels again like another sort of polling, which is something I I feel like I can relate to. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm really interested in how other people experience it, and I'm always open to <laughs> to hearing people talk about uh, their own experiences. I, I find it just super fascinating. My Body's Cage book is a really beautiful object. Each page has different flavor, a different style, and everything adds up organically to create the strange, dreamy mood of My Body's Cage. So let's talk about the design process. What were the first bits, the first mechanics? How did you work on it, basically? This game, I developed a lot differently than I think I do most games. Usually I'll, I'll just be writing in like a Google Doc, but this game I worked like exclusively out of InDesign, um, basically focusing on the layout and figuring out what each page needed to be. Reading through the book was both character creation, but also learning the entire game. Just every time you'd flip a page, it would sort of tell you to do just one thing, usually something that would build on the next thing till you finally got to, you know, like a dungeon. And then you would get to just jump into play. Uh, and that's sort of what the, the idea I kept in my head is that every page needed to just be like this new piece of information. Okay, let me give you some quick info on the game system. It's a D6 system. The main mechanic is collecting the sixes and having a larger dice pool to try harder and more dangerous stuff. There are no classes, but instead, each night, each time you do dungeoning, in your dreams, you pick a bingo sheet. You know, like a real bingo sheet. And there are three sheets to choose from. Fight, Rogue and Magic. And on the rows and the columns of each sheet, instead of the traditional numbers you would have on a regular bingo sheet, you have actions. And as you play, you check them. And if you score a bingo, checking a full row or a diagonal or a column, you add dice to your pool. I knew what I wanted to do um, was the bingo sheet. I think that was probably one of the first things. Is I wanted a bingo sheet. And I knew that doing Did things you, on the sheet. Play, the question comes, I'm sorry, do you play bingo? Have you played bingo like in real yeah, life? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've played, I've played bingo. Um, it's not something I, I, you know, play recreationally or anything, but you know, it's something I know about. I, th I don't even know where the idea came from. I think I posted it on Twitter. If somebody scrolled back far enough on my Twitter, you'd probably find me saying like, oh, a character sheet has a bingo card. I think that was probably the first concrete thing that I wanted for the game. And so the whole game sort of built off of that. Doing something on the bingo sheet should give you something that makes it easier to accomplish tasks. And so it just made sense to to have it give you more dice to add to dice rolls. Um, and I think the whole game just sort of came from that. After I after I nailed that down, um, everything like the the stats giving you bonuses and then the genre letting you like double your dice, all that stuff sort of just came after knowing like, yeah, the main mechanic is just gathering dice so that you can do more dangerous stuff while you're in the dungeon and then just working it out through the layout, which was a really slow process, but uh, <laughs> uh, it worked. Uh, people seem to like the layout, so that's good. <laughs> There's another mechanic that I find absolutely brilliant and, and super fun. It's the mechanic of the inventory. The inventory sort of acts as hit points. When you take damage, you lose things in your inventory slots. And I say things because the inventory can hold objects, but also other things like immaterial things. The idea originally came from ultraviolet grasslands 
it has that uh, game system sort of in the back of the book where your inventory holds like skills, um, but also like things that you know. So it's sort of like it's an inventory system, but it, it holds memories too and like abilities. Um, and when I'm just reading through that and seeing that, I was like, that's a really cool idea. And that's that was just kind of in the back of my head. And when I finally got to my body as a cage where I needed to figure out like, okay, how do how do you fight things in the dungeon? How do they hurt you? That idea sort of popped up to the front of my head. I wanted it to be really simple. I didn't want there to be like a whole bunch of things you have to keep track of. So yeah, I was like just heavily inspired by Ultraviolet Grasslands, even though I know a lot of people give the system in that book a lot of a lot of flack. Um, the inventory system was just super inspiring as a way to sort of represent a person's brain more than just like a backpack. Here's all the things that you hold in your head. And since you're in a dream, when you get hurt, those are the things you lose. Um, so you have a D6 dice pool and some mechanics will help you gain dice or on the contrary, lose dice. For example, the stats. The stats are not a variation on the usual numerical stats. Rather, there are six stats you draw from two D100 tables, like for example, flexible, criminal, fanatical, fair. You will assign bonuses or maluses to these stats that will modify the number of dice you throw. There are other beautiful tables throughout the book that bring a lot of flavor to the game and contribute to the dice pool mechanic, like the genre table, the ideals table, or the insecurities table. The stats one came first, and that was that was literally me just like looking at a list of different positive and you know negative like personality traits. I like literally just googled that and was looking at them, and I was like, these would make you know pretty good stats if you needed some kind of different game that didn't use like strength and dexterity. And so I just like cherry picked the ones I liked the best from both lists. Um, and I had done that for a different game that I never released, just a different project that I had been working on. So when it came time to to kind of figure out what Cage was, I was just like, oh, that would fit perfectly and just kind of stole it from my other Google Doc that I had. For the insecurities, um, for like the NPCs and stuff, a lot of that just came from me or from people I knew. That one took longer to write, writing down different anxieties that I had throughout the day or like thinking back to high school. That was a big thing. Just like, how did I feel as a high schooler? And then just write down a bunch of the the horrible things that I that would think about myself. And then I went through and I edited them and took out some of the ones that were maybe a little too much or not enough to try to find a nice balance because I wanted there to be like some relatability so that when you rolled one, gave it to a character, or gave it to an NPC, it would be something that you could empathize with or, or understand at least that would make them maybe not seem like a bad person. And you would be like, oh, this is just somebody who's struggling. That was, that was the main goal. I wanted to make some of the obstacles in the game to not just be monsters. I wanted them to, you know, just problems that people, you know, deal with in their everyday life, stuff that doesn't really have an easy answer. But yeah. Bats runs also a great YouTube channel with video essays on games and on TTRPG games. I totally recommend this channel and I'll put the link to it into the show notes. Actually, Bat studied in film school and sometimes in those videos, he also talks about film. So you've studied film uh, in school, and uh, but do you still watch films? Yeah, I, I, th I think film is probably like my my thing that I I hold above all other art form. Um, it, it's something I don't tend to talk a lot about because I have a lot of opinions about, and I don't necessarily feel like dumping them on people just <laughs> just like randomly. But yeah, film is sort of like it, it's my favorite form of art. I think there's just something about it. So yeah, I do. I definitely still have that in me. In your videos, you talk a lot about video games and RPGs, RPGs. And I remember in one of the videos you talk about the Japanese director Kurosawa. So I was wondering, does your, your knowledge or, or your passion for films uh, influence or informs the way you, you think of games? So I, I studied screenwriting specifically. You know, it's a very specific kind <laughs> of writing. It has a very specific kind of format and flow. And I try, I don't always succeed, but I try to be very minimalist when it comes to writing. Um, and that, that definitely comes from screenwriting. You know, you end up writing hundreds of, you know, script pages <laughs> when you're when you're in film school. And um, 
just that idea of uh, focusing on the action, focusing on the exact words you use, trying to say as much as you can with as little as possible. I feel like there is a lot of overlap with how a lot of people view tabletop role playing games. You know, you want the rules to be you know easy to understand, quick to read, and I feel like a lot of that could be helped by you know looking at screenwriting and how pragmatic they are with words and action and stuff like that. As I told you in the beginning of the episode, BATS is kickstarting right now my Body is a Cage Extended Edition, which is a hardcover book with contribution from tons of super talented artists and designers. And honestly, seeing the roster of creators that BATS has put together, I can't wait to see the book. It was an idea that I had pretty soon after I released like the first edition of the book. I realized I wanted to have just more. I wanted to make it bigger. I wanted to have a bunch of adventures in it for people to run. Even though, you know, I, I did the layout for the book, it was exhausting. <laughs> um, it, it Towards the end, it was like really hard to to come up with new ideas um, for to like to make the pages look, you know, unique from one another, but still sort of fit in. And so I just knew right off the bat, I would need other people simply because to kind of keep that eclectic feeling, it would be easier if it wasn't all coming from from me. If I just had other people do their own thing, that in and of itself would make the style a lot more eclectic and thus sort of add to the overall tone. So like everybody who is working on the project, I didn't give them any direction. I just told them like the deadlines that we would have if it did get funded. Um, But I just said like, hey, pitch me some ideas. We'll talk about a little bit. I will pay you to write it and lay it out. uh, And then you just give it to me and it goes in the book. I don't want to tell you what it has to look like or anything like that because I want to just get other people's sensibilities so far with the stuff I've seen, and I can't wait to show it off, it has, it's has it been working and I'm super excited for it. But yeah, um, as for how I chose the people, I got, I posted on Twitter just like asking like, hey, does anybody want to make <laughs> an adventure for this, for this game? And then gave them an email address and a bunch of people emailed me. I recognize some of them, some of them I, I didn't. I would say I've worked with maybe about it's half of these team, people. Right? It's quite a big team, your yeah, no, it's it's definitely the the biggest uh, group of people I've worked with for one project. But I've, I I know or have known some of them. I would say about half of them for a while, and then of those people that I knew, I've worked with a few of them. So they were pretty easy to kind of get on board. But everybody else, I just had them, you know, like I said, just pitched to me, and the the pitches that I liked just kept narrowing it down until it fit the budget that I wanted to hit. Bats works on several projects. There's my body's a cage. There's also a dungeon, which is another dungeon crawler is working on. And as a matter of fact, he works as a a full-time designer. Here's Baus about that. After my last Kickstarter in October, it was for Dot Dungeon. It's another dungeon crawler. I love dungeons. Um, (laughs) It's more about the split between real life and like an online life playing in an MMO. But uh, so sort of similar ideas, but different uh, execution. But after I after I did that game, it did pretty well. Um, it blew past the the goal that I set, and I had been working from home because of the the lockdown, and I hated my job. <laughs> I was sick of it, so I said, uh, you know, screw it. I'm going to throw caution to the wind, and I quit the job. And so far, it's been working out. There's been some hiccups with you know fulfilling that Kickstarter, but everything seems to be coming together now, and this one's doing well too. So as long as I can, <laughs> as long as I can keep writing things that people like, hopefully, I can keep it up. You kind of reunited. The, the two parts, the two separate parts. Yeah, that, that's a good way of thinking about it, yeah. <laughs> My life has been a lot easier doing it full-time because I feel like a lot of people, I, I don't know if you would relate to this at all, a lot of people who are in this scene, you know, we think about games like all the time. I do. Even when I was at work, all I could do is think about, oh, what am I going to do in the next game? Or what am I going to write when I get home? So being able to just you know, have what is always going on in my head be part of my life now is like super, I don't know, it's really nice. I'm really grateful for all the people who have liked my stuff so far because it is, it has made things a lot easier. (laughs) That was Bats, designer of My Body is a Cage. The Kickstarter for My Body is a Cage Extended Edition hardcover book is about to finish. I'll put a link to the Kickstarter page in the show notes. I'll put also a link to Bat's YouTube channel. Be sure to check it. (laughs) 
The Lost Bay is a podcast about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. It's produced by me, Iko, and music is by Every Eyes. If you want to get in touch or get news about the podcast, you can find me on Twitter at The Lost Bay. Thank you so much for listening and salut, à bientôt.